Assistant Professor in Social Entrepreneurship in Trinity's um, Business School in Trinity College. She's the Associate Director of the Global Business Undergraduate Degree Programme and the Director of Engagement at the Trinity Centre for Social Innovation. So um, we're in great, uh, there's great experience that Sheila's bringing. Um, her doctoral research was about surviving the peace processes of organisational identity work in response to deinstitutionalization of Irish peace building. I think I've got that right, Sheila. Yeah. Um, um, but I know that you've also um, done a lot of work in continuing to contribute to knowledge about how organizations influence, respond to social and cultural change. And you've studied contexts including peace building and LGBTQ rights and uh, digital disruption and just transition sustainability and so on. So Sheila, I won't um, say more because I think you're probably going to touch on some of those themes as you as you speak to us. So um, you're very welcome and over to Sheila. Thank you very much, Susie. Is everyone can hear me okay? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So today I decided to focus on um, looking at the process of social entrepreneurship in order to um, look at diff very different approaches to teaching and learning about social enterprise. So one thing about sometimes social enterprise is called a big tent area. So it includes a, a wide range of different things from social business to individual entrepreneurs who start up a social purpose um, organization. And so um, what I've done is I've, I've uh, so I'm using the idea of the process of social entrepreneurship and how that's taught to look at very different approaches to it. Um, so feel free to put any questions in the chat. I'll see if I can uh, uh, keep track of them as we go along, but I might miss them as well. Now, let me just see, here we go. Okay, so Susie, thank you for that lovely introduction. You've already covered everything here, so I don't need to do to say too much, but um, so I've been teaching social entrepreneurship for the past six years in Trinity Business School. Um, but, and, and then I've been researching um, an area of social entrepreneurship that I, I think is a little bit unusual. It's not kind of the mainstream of social entrepreneurship because it looks at uh, social change type organizations like peace building organizations, um, things that are often studied under social movements. So reproductive rights movement in Ireland, um, marriage equality movement, um, digital disruption is another one I've looked at. I've looked at um, beef farming in Ireland. And the common theme through all of this is how people organize for social change. And what do we mean by social change? Um, so I think a bit of an underlying theme through, through this talk will be the idea of um, that starting a social business is not the same thing as bringing about social change, but there's overlap between the two. The two things are related, um, but I think it's useful to distinguish between those two. Um, and it, so I suppose from my experience of teaching social entrepreneurship, I've looked through various textbooks. Um, and so I'm gonna to look today at three different approaches to process that come from these textbooks that are used uh, in different subject areas uh, to teach social enterprise. My main focus has been teaching social enterprise and social entrepreneurship in business schools. Um, and it is now widely taught in business schools and it is um, kind of a attractive or selling point of business schools to have kind of a social purpose type uh, themes throughout. Um, so topic, topics taught are business ethics, uh, corporate sustainability, corporate responsibility, and social en social enterprise, social entrepreneurship. Um, and prior to, to uh, being at the business school, I was it worked in nonprofits for about 12 years, six years. I was based in Northern Greece, working in Southeast Europe um, in a civil society organization um, on various different projects there, mainly doing fundraising uh, with gra grant writing type fundraising. And then six years in peace building in Ireland um, in the Glen Cree Center for Peace and Reconciliation, uh, which is still going strong. And in the business school, we have this uh, a research center called the Center for Social Innovation. So here's some of my colleagues here and uh, participants in a project that we have. Um, so it's a research center that's been around for um, maybe 
three, five years now. And it brings together the colleagues that are in this area of kind of social purpose organizing. So social innovation, social entrepreneurship, business ethics, corporate sustainability, all these, all these kind of different areas. Um, so <clears throat> the why I'm focusing on the process of social entrepreneurship. So the picture in the top right there is the foyer of the new business school in Trinity, which I haven't been for over a year now, but <laughs> this is what it look, what it still looks like. Um, and what I'd like to focus on in the different approaches is kind of the limitations of them and how they kind of, they're, they're often working in parallel, like a siloed kind of approach um, that we have uh, with these different processes. So, and, and then I think maybe at the end, we can compare and contrast the three different approaches and maybe how each are valuable, what we can take from each, and maybe how we can integrate a little bit um, benefits from, from different approaches. So, um, so the, the first approach is basically it just extending commercial entrepreneurship models to social ventures. So those three references there are three textbooks that really quite specifically do that and say that that's their purpose. Um, and then as part of doing that, you have uh, slightly different tools. So, you know, the textbooks will be, give a background of what's, what is social entrepreneurship um, and then different tools you can use as part of starting a social enterprise or um, developing a social enterprise or analyzing social entrepreneurship, et cetera. So things like developing a problem statement, using a lean business model canvas, applying Porter's five forces. Um, so you can Google any of these and find, um, and find what they're, I'll talk about it in a minute as well, what they, what they look like a little bit, but just really briefly. I try to focus mainly on, on how the process is conceptualized rather than the specific tools um, and the tools you can, that are kind of promoted under each different approach. The second approach I'm calling here the nonprofit approach. So it's basically taking learning from nonprofit research and experience um, and uh, applying it to social enterprise. And of course, nonprofits are not separate from social enterprise. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, many social enterprises are nonprofits, uh, but certainly some are not. Um, and the main focus there is around alignment. So uh, how to align mission uh, activities, resources, impact, um, how do you align it all? And the textbook that does this most is, is Kickle and Lyons. There's a re list of references at the end, and I'm happy to share these slides so you don't have to worry about taking notes or uh, I can circulate them afterwards if you like. So the, the main tools that you'd find in this approach are the logic model framework, which many of you might be familiar with, the theory of change, which is related, social value propositions. So I'll talk about that one in a little bit to just look at the process. Um, and then the third one is how to conceptualize the process of social change. And we know a lot about that from another completely separate but very large area of research on social movements. It tends to be in departments of political science or international relations or even public, public administration. Um, so less so in, in business schools. So I suppose my, I'm quite unusual in that I'm interested in social movements and how that overlaps with social enterprise and that I'm located in a business school. Um, but there is, more and more, um, there is more and more research in that area. So um, particularly around uh, corporate advocacy. So for-profit businesses uh, trying to bring about social change or taking a position on social change through their profit-making work. Um, so there's loads of diff there's a huge uh, area of research on social movements, but one one sort of tool that you can use to analyze a social movement, I, probably the biggest one is actor mapping is the is the first yeah it's the probably the largest the first thing you'd come across, and then chronology is something that I I'll mention a bit later, and then the issue of the idea of issue framing, so how different actors frame issues in order to bring about the change they're looking for. That's, um, I won't go into, into details on that, but that's just another kind of major uh, tool that you'll find in social movements. And then Theory U is one I'll touch on as well, which um, it's, it's <clears throat> around uh, social movements, how to bring about social change, completely separate from social entrepreneurship, but very relevant to it, I think. So first of all, we'll look at the commercial approach. So I chose this picture uh, deliberately uh, because it shows a lack of diversity, <laughs> gender and ethnic, um, which perhaps isn't fair uh, that the commercial approach can uh, is not uh, entirely uh, 
lacking in diversity. Um, but in business schools, we have the approach to social enterprise, sometimes called the innovation school of thought in the literature. And it's about applying um, commercial models to uh, social purpose. And so every business school you can find nowadays will have an incubator hub, an innovation, something or other. Um, uh, it'll have a uh, accelerator program. It'll have a pitching competition. So all of these things come from multinational corporations and entrepreneurship. So how they innovate in multinational corporations um, and the language used, used there. So this textbook by Brooks um, deliberately and specifically applies that model to social purpose. And this is, uh, oh, sorry, go back. So this is the process of social entrepreneurship according to this, that textbook. Um, and you can see that it's linear, that it has five steps. It starts with recognizing an opportunity, finding an unmet need. And then concept development is around developing new products or markets. And that's because there's the whole purpose is ge generating revenue, not applying for grants. So you can only generate revenue if there's a market for what you're selling. So, um, but, but also identifying the social rewards or the social impact. Um, and then resource determination, you can see the language used here is human resources and human capital. So it's how to create a social business, basically. Um, there's no talk of communities or there's no talk of uh, people or um, beneficiaries or stakeholders. You talk about stakeholders perhaps a bit later, um, but it's interesting to see kind of the terminology that's used. Um, and I have I, I think that this terminology now has ha, has creeped into a lot of our areas in community development. Um, and we use these terms, I think you're all familiar with them, but they, they come from uh, multinationals and corporate type approaches. Um, and then launch and venture growth, measurement of returns, and then goal attainment, as easy as that, success. And then you move on to your next issue, uh, which we all know <clears throat> addressing a social issue isn't, isn't quite as easy as five steps, but uh, any, anyway, there we have the linear approach. Another example is this. So another five steps where you have your view, uh, there's a, often a focus on identifying in quite a kind of basic way uh, the problem statement. So high level, keep it simple, and win over in a pitching session. So the, the point is to be able to kind of quickly and effectively uh, sell your story to investors. Like that's kind of what's underlying a lot of this. And one of the one of the main tools for that is this lean business model canvas. So I won't go into it in detail, but this would be a tool that is that would be used in an incubator or in an accelerator program. And you you just kind of it's sort of like a really brief high level type business plan where you plug in, you fill in these different these different ideas so that you articulate your unique value proposition, for example. Um, another <clears throat> concept that you'd come across in this area is a design sprint that comes from Google. Google designed this. It's five day intensive way of uh, coming up with a new idea and testing it out, having a prototype, getting feedback, launching it, um, and then adjusting based on, on the feedback that you find. But you'll find, um, you'll find the, these words used in other contexts as well. And then just as here to illustrate that incubators and accelerators are, are more and more widespread and part of this approach. So what I would see as the advantages of this approach is that it, just, it spells out discrete phases and that can be useful. They're, they, they can help you look at perhaps your work in a different way that that um, using the these terms, like it might, you know, that that might be helpful, that you have this kind of roadmap that's quite simple. Sometimes it helps to simplify a very complex issue. Um, I think the main one is access to resources and gaining legitimacy by using this language. And I think that's what we see happening in the spread of this approach. Um, and there are resources available through co pitching competitions. So that's an advantage as well. But it does miss out on some key factors. Um, it, it, it usually oversimplifies the context drastically. Um, so you do a competitor analysis and you, would con you, you, know, you want to get your market share and you see your other competitors. But of course, if you're developing a homeless service, your competitors are people with a similar vision and mission 
that you don't want to knock out of the market. <laughs> you know, you want to actually learn from them and work with them and have something complementary, perhaps, um, to their work. So a competitive approach can be can be useful, but I think often in developing a social purpose organization, it's far more effective to have a collaborative type of approach. Um, and that that's a weakness, I think, in the commercial approaches. Um, and then we don't have a lot of evidence that it encourages social innovation. In fact, a lot of the ideas that come through the pitching sessions and that, that very few actually kind of make it and come up with something new. Uh, we tend to point to the same very few examples of success each time. There's not, uh, and then in our in the literature, there's not a lot um, kind of to show that this this is the route to innovation. And in fact, we find that innovation comes from social mission more, or there's there's some evidence to show that it's social mission and. Um, embedded in a social issue is where the innovation comes from rather than kind of a pitching session or this high level launching in from the outside type approach and does it lead to social change we don't know we don't have the evidence to that i would say um, but it's an interesting one to reflect on i think so um the non-profit approach um how am i doing in terms of time susie it's uh I, well, I didn't keep track in the beginning and my yeah, we didn't start exactly at you on time Sheila so you should be okay for okay uh, around okay. another eight minutes I think it's okay so I'll zoom, I'll zoom through this a bit because I think most people would already be familiar with this approach and I chose this picture because it kind of shows a little bit like what I would feel is a is a familiar setting in terms of community type organizing where you're sitting in a circle and uh, a community. So this, I sorry for the bad, bad quality, but I uh, just scanned this from the textbook by V. Skillern uh, and others, um, and it's a, a textbook on social entrepreneurship, and it applies sort of nonprofit impact based approaches, is what I would call it, and the focus is on identifying and developing a social value proposition. So you can see already from this model that it's within a specific context. So the context from the very beginning is part of the idea and developing the idea. Um, and so the social value proposition is, is the, the intended impact of the venture. It's, it brings together the three elements um, of people, opportunity, and capital to, to uh, have, bring about a specific social impact. Um, so the process model is this, um, and this comes from the textbook, The Kickle and Lion, so a different one, but this is a pretty popular textbook for social entrepreneurship, uh, perhaps the most widely used. Um, and so you can see that this is the same model as the social value proposition, but it's that the idea in the middle on the left, go, it becomes the mission, which is the model on the right, that the context is still there and significant, and that you're basically, um, the process involves turning a need into an opportunity, an individual motivation into the people involved who will make it happen, and the capacity or the potential into resources. So that's uh, one, another model in a social entrepreneurship textbook that is quite different from the linear commercial model. Um, and it's more around, uh, taking into consideration the context, the specific context, and how do you do turn your idea into a mission and articulate a social value proposition. Um, I won't go, I won't, um, that just specifies the different uh, elements, but the opportunity recognition tools that they focus on in that textbook is a SWOT analysis and a PESL analysis, which are fairly widely used actually in, in, in all sectors, but that kind of shows the PESL analysis is a way of showing taking into consideration the context. Um, and then a SWOT analysis is for event, um, evaluating potential ideas, strengths, weaknesses, et cetera. The third approach, social movement approach. Um, so I chose this picture uh, just to kind of illustrate that uh, social movements look quite different from uh, pitching sessions and look quite different from community organizing, although certainly there's overlap, of course. Um, so one, one kind of model or process model, you could say, for, for understanding social movements is theory U. So some of you may have come across this Otto Scharmer at MIT and Peter Senge and others. 
Um, I put the link down at the bottom if they have all sorts of videos. They're great at, at, at communicating what they do actually, much better than most uh, academics. Uh, and so it's, it's a framework for understanding a change process. And it's really different to a pitching session, but yet it comes from MIT Business School, Sloan Business School. So, um, so that's interesting that it comes, it actually came from a business school. Although Otto Scharmer isn't, isn't business background. Um, I think he's org theory, sociology, I'm not sure. Um, so, so how they describe it is it's a way of being, moving from mindless reacting to reframing and regenerating. So this is the process model. Um, and it starts on the left about downloading past patterns or seeing things in a new way. Um, and then it's, it's basic, it's sort of a framework for working in groups, trying to see what's happening in the field and then um, coming up with ideas together for how we might act in a new way and bring about a substantial type of change. And it's very much about self-reflection. What's my role in this? Who am I? Who are we as a group? So really like self-reflective and you can see very different from a, a linear five-step First you do X, then you do Y. You know, it's much more kind of secular, iterative, working together in a group, um, uh, almost like group therapy, I would say. Um, and then to bring in this idea of legitimacy. So my, my research has looked really at this concept of legitimacy quite a lot, which is um, comes from institutional theory. And it's a generalized perception or assumption that the actions of an entity are desirable, proper, or appropriate within some socially constructed system of norms, values, beliefs, and definitions. So there's a definition of uh, legitimacy. So um, the last one here, so this pragmatic, which is, um, uh, you know, if you use the right language, you will have legitimacy. There's moral, so there's like a normative underpinning that um, social enterprise is considered a good thing. We think that this is uh, positive. If you talk about social enterprise, you might gain funding. So that's an, a, an idea of normative. Um, and then cognitive, that's the trickiest one because that's taken for granted legitimacy. So we think we know what's taken for granted, but actually, you know, by definition, it's what you don't notice. Um, so, for example, in order to really understand uh, what do we mean by taken for granted legitimacy, are these things legitimate? So smoking tobacco used to be considered sexy. It was in all the Hollywood films, people, the stars were smoking. And now, of course, it's completely uh, turned around and it has lost legitimacy as something doesn't have normative legitimacy. Um, it's relegated to certain areas. It, uh, so and you can track over time how smoking tobacco lost legitimacy. Um, corporal punishment of children. It used to be considered good parenting to hit children, right? Spare the rod and spoil the child. And now of course it's considered bad parenting. Uh, and not only that, but it's illegal. So there's been a complete shift in legitimacy on corporate punishment. Um, I won't go through each of these. Um, it, they were examples and I think the time is short. But um, just to say that it's easier to understand taking le for granted legitimacy when you're looking at things that have lost legitimacy. But you, it's, it is harder than we realize to understand what has taken for granted legitimacy um, today. Um, and it usually comes from the margins of the field. So it's the people who often sound a bit crazy or a bit out there who are maybe the first voices that articulate what has taken for granted legitimacy. And when it's articulated, there's often very strong responses to it and emotive responses and the responses tend to be very polarized. Um, so um, I put the example here of owning people of slavery. So when, when slavery was first kind of um, a movement to abolish slavery, the res a, a broad response was it's essential to our economic system. So, you know, that's crazy. We can't get rid of slavery. It's, it's, it's a fundamental part of our economic system, which is, of course, what we say about fossil fuels today. So um, it's interesting looking kind of historically about how those changes happen. Um, and so by I've just as an example, um, using a chronology can be a really useful way to understand how an organization responds and influences things that happen in the context. So this is a, a case study of one um, LGBT organization in Ireland, the National LGBT Federation or NXF. 
Um, and the top line is the organization's timeline and the bottom is in the context relevant events that were happening. So when you spell it out in a timeline like this, you can see actually when they were founded in 1979, they didn't have any kind of organizational legitimacy. And in 1993, is when we removed from law that homosexual acts were illegal in Ireland until 1993, let alone any type of sense of it can, that a sexuality or an identity. That um, you know, so when they when they founded this organization, we kind of forget how what it must have been like when your very existence didn't have legitimacy. So so chronologies are are can be very effective way to understand uh, legitimacy, and I I put it back together with this theory you process that um, if you think of this as a, as a chronology that in this that it involves in the first steps on the top left about seeing things with fresh eyes means understanding what has taken for granted legitimacy um, and then that's the first step in social change and then and that can bring about changing attitudes and then organizing differently um, so I'm kind of whizzing through all of this, but to compare the three, uh, and this is the last point, Susie, I know I've, I think I've gone over a little, um, uh, comparing three different approaches. So the linear approach, uh, which has really no context or environment taken into consideration, um, and then the Kickle and Lyons complex model of idea creation. So the social value proposition or the nonprofit approach, I should say, and then theory U. So um, well, you could look at it this way, like levels, so the linear model could be more like social entrepreneurs, like an individual, how you might plot out what you plan on doing. And then social value proposition might be more about a group of people in a specific context, um, organizing for impact and aligning the different activities with the impact they intend to have. And then ther theory you might be more around changing attitudes in society. So it goes from kind of a micro level of individual, meso level of community, let's say, and then macro level of society. So those three three approaches, I mean, we could say, oh, this one's good, that one's bad, but I, I find it more useful to kind of see what role do each of them play or what could we take from each of them. And so perhaps it's about levels or perhaps it's about degrees of change. So the linear model might be useful for small changes that preserve the status quo. They don't challenge what's legitimate, but it might be that it's useful for designing a new product or service or for a charity that's opening a coffee shop, you know, something that you're not trying to change attitudes, you're just have a social purpose. And then there's a, there's a business model that would make sense that would kind of fit with it, that it's sort of a, um, that it's, it's for social purpose initiatives where the main purpose isn't to change, bring about a social movement, um, but to just um, create a small business perhaps that has a social purpose. Um, and then the social value proposition model might be kind of a smaller, small change, hoping to trickle up to a big change. You know, so it might be kind of halfway between social change and social business. And then theory U more about revolutionary change and paradigm shift. Or it could be about types of change. So perhaps the linear one is like a change in products or services. So like a new type of product, you know, like bamboo toothbrushes or plastic used from that's been taken from the ocean to make a t-shirt or you know so it could be about a, a product or service and then the nonprofit one might be around more like around a change in well-being so providing a service that's actually going to improve our well-being but not necessarily make a massive social change and then theory you might be more around change in legitimacy and that's it thank you very much those are the three the three images there the three different approaches to process um, and how I see them fitting together so I hope that's been uh, given some food for thought. Thank you, Sheila. That's fantastic. And um, we were going to switch now um, and maybe uh, speaking with Two, four, three. Speaking again, because I may have. Yeah, perfect. OK, don't be nervous at all. I'm actually terrified, Rosie, if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> the more people that signed up for this event, the more terrified I became. So, I mean, we're in we're in, in great company. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Susie. And uh, I think you've said more than enough about myself. So uh, to start with, I'm just going to um, give just um, a, an introduction to the work that we do in Dignity Partnership. And I will start by telling a story about Brian. Brian came from Zimbabwe and in Zimbabwe, he was doing accounting job. 
and um, he had to flee for uh, uh, fear of persecution. And he came in Ireland and uh, he's been living in direct provision for the past three years. And he's trying to find a job that would be somehow similar to what he was doing in um, in Zimbabwe, but unfortunately, he's he, he can't find his way out. He can't find his way around. And he's been advised by the people who've been living in direct provision that here in Ireland, the only thing that he can do is either to work in the factories or to become a care, to do care job. And for him, that's not an option for him. And he wishes he could start uh, his own kind of like bookkeeping and become a bookkeeper and help people with bookkeeping. But he doesn't know where to start. He doesn't know whether he can be self-employed in the country. He has all these questions that I have, like, where do I start? Where are the supports? And what are the legal requirements for me to become a bookkeeper? And I'm sure some of you, you know, it's not that much of a hard task for an individual to become a bookkeeper. You know, if you, you have the qualifications, you just have to go and register for the TIN number. But for him, he doesn't have all this information. And also, um, there is a research, I did a bit of research about integration of refugees through entrepreneurship, which I feel like here in Ireland is a bit lacking. A research shows that refugees and people seeking asylum come from a diverse range of backgrounds, but we find that their skills, they are not used or they are underutilized. And um, entrepreneurship is another way of also integrating um, refugees into our community, apart from uh, people getting employed. And I do know there are agencies out there who are supporting people with uh, entrepreneurial um, ideas, but then not much has been done for the people living in direct provision. And um, sometimes you find people would want to join the entrepreneurial journey, but because of the multiple needs that they have, they will tend to be seen like, okay, maybe they're not interested or they're not eager to do these things. And the needs for the people, they're actually overlooked. And also there's this issue of uh, not having enough support for someone trans transitioning from direct provision into the community. Oftentimes, the, uh, the option that they have is to assimilate in the labor market or they should get back to education. And maybe for someone who is coming from a country where English wasn't their um, uh, first language, they would think of the idea of going back into education as something that is a non-starter. They would also think of like, okay, having to go and work in, um, let me just give an example. In a factory shop, it's not, I mean, in a factory uh, manufacturing company, they would start, find that overwhelming. And as a result, you find that people, they would translate from direct provision and just stay on the social, receiving social, yet they have a skill, yet they have the talent that if they can be helped with that skill, with that talent, they can become uh, self-employed. So this is where Dignity Partnership comes in. So we are, in, we are very new anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> if you see me saying things that are not true, just know that we are very new. So we are very new. We actually started in two, 2019, just before the lockdown. And uh, we are here to promote integration of refugees and people seeking uh, international protection through personal development, self-employment and entrepreneurship programs. So our vision is to see a country where refugees have opportunity to develop their skills and talent with a sense of autonomy and better mental well-being. And how do we do this? We create a platform tailored to the needs of refugees, entrepreneur, uh, refugee entrepreneurs, where they can develop and grow their skills and talent into profitable businesses. Sorry. Yeah, so the question I was asked was, why did we choose a uh, social entrepreneur? I mean, why did we choose social enterprise? We felt like the social enterprise would be a fit, a good model fit for the work that we wanted to do, the change that we wanted to make. We seeing that there's a lot of skills that are being wasted, like I've mentioned, in the direct provision. And how can we monetize the skills? How can we monetize the passion? So the idea for us was to see how can we support uh, the people living in direct provision or those who have transit from direct provision, monetize the skills and the talents that they have. Because 
work is not for everyone. Like being employed is not for everyone. And people have got, as I mentioned, they've got different needs that if those needs are not met, they'll end up just uh, having their skills wasted. So our mission is to support refugees succeed, succeed through the power of their own ideas. And I've just included here um, a speech that um, the commissioner, Yiva Johnson, uh, said, I mean, he stressed, he stressed the importance of the EU and groups that work with refugees, not to see refugees as vulnerable people who just need protection, but also utilize their skills and um, their strength. I should say I am one of, um, uh, should I say, I have my own testimony, like I was someone who was living in direct provision and I had to fight to be out there to say, yes, things happen. Yes, life happened for me. But there is also another version of me which I would like to focus on, not only what happened to me. I don't want to focus on the misfortune that happened to me, but I also want to focus on the positive side. I don't want to lose all my skills. And then at the end of the day, I find myself, I'm useless. And it doesn't matter whether I am living in the country or I have been sent either sent back to the country I came from, or I've been sent to another country, but still I want that skill of mine to be to stay with me and to be upgraded. So what worked uh, for us? Yeah, I should say it was really a challenge, considering that um, uh, we started our journey and then the lockdown happened. So it was a huge challenge, but we are very happy that with the different supports that we got, we managed to pull through. And uh, yeah, we were on the social enterprise. When I say we, sometimes I misuse this word. I was on the Social uh, Entrepreneurs Island Academy, and that's where I actually, um, I had to uh, strategize and look at the problem what that I, I want to solve. And um, yeah, that's why I got most of my knowledge on um, becoming a social entrepreneur. And uh, I also owe some of the work that I do to Ankosan. As I, uh, Susie mentioned, uh, I was a student in Ankosan with the community development. And I should say all the learning that I did in Ankosan, I still use it to date. And sometimes I go look into my assignment when I'm stuck, which I think is somehow lacking when it comes to social enterprise, where you don't know, this is just uh, in my own views, maybe there are people who have uh, places where they can reference. So oftentimes I go back to my community development work and reference the work that I'm doing. So what worked for us is providing support tailored to the needs of our members and also collaboration with other organizations. So like at the moment we have strong links with the Leach Partnership Company. We've just built a relationship with Inner City Enterprise and uh, NUI Galway. And also understanding the problem before trying to solve. So, like with Dignity Partnership, I had different solutions to this problem, but each, each time I do something, I find to say, no, 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 maybe this is not the fit, this is not the solution. So I have to go back and see, okay, what are the real root causes? What is happening? What is causing all these things? And how can we tackle these root causes? And also I had to understand our value proposition. Why are we here? Why are we doing what we're doing? So there will be some times that I'll actually feel down and I'll be like, okay, maybe I'm just wasting time. I shouldn't do like this. But then again, I'll go back like, okay, but this is needed. That's why we created this. And also co-creating of value with our members. So we engage a lot with, uh, when I say the members, I mean the people that we're supporting. I mean the people that we're providing the service to. So we, we co-create value with them by asking them what is it that they need? How can we support them? Which angle can we come in to create the support that they need to create the social, the social change that we're looking to make? And also we create member engagement teams in the different DP centers to be our ears on the ground to find out are we, are we making any impact? Are we making any changes? And also understanding the needs of our members and also learning about education marketing which i actually i didn't know about it until i started doing my course with ucc and uh, that's when i learned to say you know what if i implicate if i if you implicate uh, i mean implement if we implement education marketing it's gonna help us more than just posting things on the social media 
just you know because at first it was just like okay putting this on the social media putting that and we had to sit down and think to say okay are we reaching the people that we're supposed to reach yes the social media is the in thing but is it working for us so what didn't work it was a one size fits all approach so at first it was about okay let's just do this workshop and uh, this is what we need to do but then we had to find a different way of um doing our work different way of promoting our workshops different way of conducting the workshops as well and the other challenge was measure, measuring our impact so we learn about doing surveys we learn about giving out uh, questionnaires those are the things that i actually i was doing at first i would spend time making surveys spend time making questionnaires and i'll find only two people have responded only one person has re responded so I had to find different ways of finding out how to measure impact. And one of the ways was like, if we do an event or we do a workshop, after the workshop, I would be ringing people, depending on how many people were there, I would ring a couple of them and just to get their fill. And also uh, we have a, a list of volunteers and we also engage with the volunteers to check in with the people who have uh, participated um, in the workshops. And then also applying for funding as a social enterprise has been a challenge because, okay, social enterprise, you must have uh, a traded income. And we do not, at the moment, we don't really have because of all this lockdown, like our plans, like our business model has kind of like been messed up. So we don't have that traded income. And then you can't also apply as an NGO because we don't have the, uh, what's the word, the, the number, like uh, we are not a registered NGO. So we, we actually, actually we're, we're like in, we're stuck in the middle there. So that has also been a challenge. So I'm just gonna be fast, I see my time is, is gone. So, and then uh, the supports, the support that we've received, and I should say like um, the programs such as the ones that are being done by the Social Entrepreneurs Island has really been, uh, has helped us a lot. It has given us uh, legitimacy as well, legibility. It has give, given us to be eligibility, uh, like uh, when we come and say, okay, we are on the academy with the Social Entrepreneurs Island, or we were on the Action Lab, we kind of like, uh, people would listen to us more than just coming to say, oh, okay, this is a group led by uh, people living in direct provision, and this is what we're trying to do. And also strong network support that we have like uh, from Ancosan as well. It has been a good support for us. And for myself doing uh, my studies, doing my master's with um, UCC, it gives me practical um, and knowledge on how I should, um, I should do my work with the Dignity Partnership. So most of the time when I'm doing my courses and I'm doing my assignments, I'm always looking back at Dignity Partnership. And also incubator uh, programs, like the ones that are being done by the Social Impact Island has really uh, been uh, um, of good help for us and uh, very beneficial. Like I attended, uh, I think it was December, D Dublin incubator by the Social Impact Island. And for me, it was very important because it helped me as in an individual because being a social entrepreneur is a lonely journey. And I, I learned how to take care of myself, how not to bite what I cannot uh, chew. And also attending different webinars, different trainings, like today early in the morning, I mean, listening to Dr. Sheila has really been something that I've learned from her and I would keep in touch with her as well. And also uh, peer learning and uh, support. Uh, yeah, peer learning, sometimes you get overwhelmed and you look back to other social entrepreneurs and uh, learn from them. And uh, the challenges that we've experienced is um, yeah, starting a social enterprise where you're supporting people who are unable to pay for their services has been a challenge. So you are depending on funding and then you cannot apply funding as a social entrepreneur because you don't have any traded income. And then you can't apply funding as a charity because you don't have charitable status. So that has really been a challenge. And uh, I just added this topic, this I mean, this line in the morning when I heard uh, Dr. Sheila talking about the overlap of uh, social enterprise and a not-for-profit has also had somehow a negative impact on the work that we're doing. Because when we come and say we're a social enterprise, we're being asked, where's your traded income? And when you come, you're a charity, where's your charity number? So, yeah. 
so how to like how do we bring the change and make an income at the same time how can we create that change and also building strong business network within the community has kind of like been a challenge for us like we really need to engage more with business communities and it has it has been really a big challenge for us and not being clear of our social enterprise governance structure was uh, challenging at first and yeah sometimes it can be overwhelming and i wish there was some kind of like a step by step tool that i could actually look back sometime when i'm a bit stuck and also looking at the bigger picture can uh, can motivate and can demotivate you as well so like sometimes i look at my vision i look what i want to see i look at the different businesses that i want to see them being set up by people living in direct provision and just looking at uh, the future and looking at the present sometimes i would get uh, demotivated so basically that's it and um, if anyone would like to know more about dignity partnership here are the contact details and our social media details so yeah thank you so much thank you. so i'm hoping that i i can follow that i can hopefully pick up on some of the themes um i'm going to introduce myself but very very briefly uh i uh this is actually my last event um, as uh, part of the Anne Kassan team, I have um, recently moved to a new role in another organization and um, at a really um, overwhelmingly uh, amazing, touching goodbye Zoom event, one of my colleagues wrote a poem about me, I'm not going to read it, but she had two lines in it that um, resonated with me very much and I'm trying to introduce myself because she said one of the lines was Susie is impossible, which is exactly what my mother always said about me. And then her next line said to um, label or put in a box and that fits more with um, my, my, my life and my work. So I am a social entrepreneur an educator and um, someone who likes working um, in the community level, at the community level. And my new role will be with TASC in the Climate Justice Centre, working as they labelled it in the field, which I quite liked because I'm really happiest in the field, as people would know me. Um, so that's enough of an introduction to who I am. Um, and I would like to also introduce um, Anne Kassan, who we're here with today, who I spent nearly three years with as a community educator. And um, the purpose of Anne Kassan's mission um, and this kind of is at the levels that we've just heard from uh, Rosie as an individual and kind of touches on the levels that Sheila was looking at with us too, is that it's uh, also a social enterprise and its mission is to bring learning within reach of people in communities right across Ireland from all ages, um, with a model that's based on inclusion, participation, social action, um, capacity building and transformative practice. And so the Ankasan really wants to try to tackle educational inequality with learning that will change lives for the better. And in their original mission and purpose that you can see there on the screen, you can see that they um will use whatever means possible to do that including looking at ways to um, enable um, entrepreneurship um, enable um, participation in as wide a possible way as possible so um the way i'm going to start out is is really from a very broad picture um, of the context in which we're talking about teaching and learning in social ent enterprise, because I think that this should help kind of frame some of the challenges that we experience as well. So the structural context that we exist within is um, neoliberal capitalism. I think um, world systems theorists would say that we're in about 500 years of capitalism. Uh, that is a constraint that creates um, a core and a periphery. So that's uh, various theorists would say that that that's how capitalism institutionalizes its oppression through the core and the periphery structure. And that structure manifests as increasing concentrations of wealth in the core 
and increasing deprivation, marginalization and poverty in the periphery. But I wanted to, to give this just this little image um, as we start off here um, of the, the private sector, if you like, um, as becoming extremely adapt and supported to capture resource and, and extract, uh, be a, an effective extractive mechanism. And government, the size is significant here is that the sort of these three domains um, where that has swollen in size and at the same time, the government's resource managing, decision-making and distribution has been shrinking and its ability to control as well um, and regulate that resource capture has also been shrinking and is, is something that, that governments find huge struggle with. And the other thing that's been sh um, shrinking is this word commoning, what we hold in common and what we manage in common. And that root word of community. So what we hold in common might still be the air, um, but is it still the water and do we manage that in common? You know, so that's the idea of um, what the community sector uh, manages or, or deals with. In Ireland, the social enterprise policy, I'm sure anyone that's been looking at this in Ireland is very familiar with this, um, published in July 2019, and it defines social enterprise as having an objective of achieving social or societal and environmental impact, um, rather than maximizing profit from its owners or shareholders. So you can see that distinction very quickly there. But also others claim that social entrepreneurs like Mo Sharam, um, who's the chief executive of Innova, which is a similar kind of social enterprise to um, Ankasan because it creates blended learning centers in low income communities. And he claims that it's also disruptive innovation to systemically impact people. So that's the claim. Um, and then the other types of social enterprises defined in the social enterprise uh, strategy by the government are also familiar probably to many of the people on this um, seminar this morning might be active in one of these domains supporting or um, being involved in them. And so you have the, the work integration uh, social enterprises that are trying to find employment for people who might be at the farthest distance from it and that kind of is interesting i think in the context um of rosie talking about not everybody wants employment um some people want to be self-employed or have enterprises but work integration um social enterprises would focus on employment for maybe people who've spent time in prison and are at a distance from the labor market um they might also have uh, work integration for people with disabilities, again, similar barriers. And one of the ones that I've been most um, in, aware of and in its inception, and I know um, Sheila is on the board of now, uh, the management committee is traveler based social enterprises for members of the traveler community also because of a distance from the labor market. But one of the things to, that I'd like to highlight about those is that uh, in my anecdotal, I'm not a researcher like Sheila, um, at least not in any kind of a classical sense. I suppose I am a story gatherer and anecdotal researcher. I like to talk to people across diverse fields and gather information, but I fail to do it in the in the academic sense. Um, and but so anecdotally, what I've uh, asked many wises um, is whether members of the communities they serve and bring into employment have uh, advancement in terms of managerial positions. And while I know, for example, um, in CART, the, the management committee would have representatives of uh, the traveler community, but that it's been quite difficult um, to find examples where you have people um, moving up in the managerial structures within the within the wises and I think that's interesting to point out um, equally you you have the enterprise development social enterprises um, which I think are a really interesting innovation in Ireland where you have social enterprises that are community enterprise centers and we had a learner on one of our programs who was manager of one of these and said she didn't realize she was a social enterprise and it's been really interesting 
how as this policy has been developed in Ireland, how many people are re uh, uh, examining their identity as social enterprises in Ireland with social missions. And then you have the community centres and what's interesting about the deficient demand social enterprises as defined here, often funded through the government um, CSP programme, Pubble, uh, and I've been working with a group of social enterprises in Donegal recently, and they've been really seeing these, uh, their, uh, the structural issues manifest. They're funded um, and asked to pay living wages to all employees, but because traded income due to COVID has fallen off a cliff um, and they're still trying to maintain their social impact, they're finding new ways to still deliver service, but their generated trade is um, already gone and they're not eligible for um, wage subsidy schemes because they're funded through Pubble. So it's interesting when it, when a threat or something like COVID comes through, these structural issues are, I think, more obvious. And then just to um, reference as well, the services contracted by the public sector to deliver services for the state. And I think there's something interesting there in having Rosie here talking about um, the uh, participants in Dignity Partnership coming in from and of uh, experience of living directly in direct provision, uh, because it stands out, the system of direct provision stands out as something contracted by the state, but was chosen to be contracted by for profits rather than social enterprises and all of uh, that uh, extraction of wealth, which I cannot document how much it has been into the private sector and how different that might have been if social mission um, and social enterprises had been contracted to deliver those services for the state. And then just one other, um, again, anecdotal piece before I move on from this is the idea that uh, one public servant that I talked to in the community division of the Department of Community and Rural, um, I was asking about when, uh, you know, all this social innovation. So when people are out seeing gaps and trying to fill them and serve um, gaps that the state isn't able to um, create, like what Rosie has created in Dignity Partnership, um, this person told me that they said they really support the idea of social innovation because the, the wheels of government move slowly and they're also not structured in ways that can drive innovation and that they would have a desire to support more of it. But they, she also noted that if it turned out that the social inter innovation that was emergent couldn't actually um, come up with a funding model. So some of the challenges Rosie's talking about that if the beneficiaries can't pay for the services, for example, um, and that so it can't easily become a social enterprise um, or, or find other funding models, but it is actually core to a government service aim or objective. It could be reabsorbed into a public service or give, given core funding. But then when I asked, and did that happen often, these innovations that are happening out in the sector, um, she did admit that that seldom happens. So there was a possibility that it was core to government aims, but that it wouldn't necessarily get government support. So I'm interested in empowering social entrepreneurs in the margins. I'm interested in community development in the margins because of that same um, framework that I said at the beginning, the concentrations of wealth at the core um, and the increasing deprivation and marginalization on the periphery. And I suppose I call that an edge and it's where I tend to hang out in organizations that are interested in working there too. Um, sometimes I wonder, is it a sort of Robin Hood uh, attitude? Um, but again, a little more definition of the problem and that idea of pushing to the margins and just some examples again of that um, and a framing that we have available to us in this year. But the being pushed to the margins is not just people like indigenous people, for example, have been pushed to the margins um, for a very long time in the colonial pattern where 100 years ago about 50% of the world's population were indigenous, whereas now we'd be talking about less than 1%. And that extractive growth model has resulted in depletion of all the resources from the natural world in these ways to push to edges, to push to marginal. 
Um, this was a, a conference I was at, this little bit you can see on the right, has to do with just how long um, things have been shifting in favor of some of the human systems uh, in the natural world. So 10,000 years ago, going back to really big view, um, it was about 2% um, weight of invertebrates were humans and about 99% weight was wild animals. Now we're at about 32% weight of humans, 1% of wild animals, and about 67% of the um, animals that we eat. Uh, and so how that has happened. So it, it's affecting every area, agricultural systems, human systems, and so on. And the current lens that we have, the relationship between all of that marginality and pushing um, poverty and deprivation in COVID-19, we know that the most structural uh, like lens we could possibly have showing um, the distribution of vaccines, for example, um, and the access to healthcare across the global perspective. So this is when we start saying it's pretty difficult, isn't it? We're trying to look at difficult social and cultural problems, and they're often described now as a wicked problem. Um, they're, they're completely complex, and they have incomplete and often contradictory knowledge, the number of people and opinions about what the issues are and how to solve them is also large. Um, there is a large economic burden in order to try to address them. And there is an interconnected nature of all the problems with all the other problems. So I wanted to, um, having started in that global place, I wanted to just briefly touch on some, all of that the stuff that I'm now gonna talk about, I've been gathering like Sheila from other writers, and I will also give um, references to people and the presentation. So um, Sheila's pointed me at many of these, by the way, um, including Edgar um, Barkey in Brazil, who works in, uh, and did a paper that where he describes the this um, social entrepreneurship that's gaining so much momentum market mechanisms making it really attractive for passionate entrepreneurs wanting to solve problems and social issues. Um, but what he points out in Brazil is that most of those initiatives are led by social entrepreneurs from privileged backgrounds trying to tackle issues that affect, affect disadvantaged populations. In contrast, um, he suggests a more inclusive system would be to enable those who come from the populations directly affected by the pressing social issues as the main protagonists. And that's really going to be the theme of what I'm trying to explore in teaching and learning. He uses the terms, by the way, elite and slum because that fits his context. Um, and it's quite different when you look at the definitions of social enterprise in the literature. It is all talking about social engineers pursuing revolutionary change for systemic problems, it's describing the school foundation describes its mission as truly transformative change, equilibrium change um, by creating social entrepreneurs who recognize the systems in need of change. And Ashoka says they're in, they define their impact as systemic change. But um, there's a review conducted um, of NGO relationships that um, point out that a major finding in the NGO re um, research in the growth and performance of social entrepreneurs is that donors and northern NGOs know very little um, about the reality of the global south um, or their clients. And it's important to realize that rich and powerful actors continually recognize that local realities are complicated and how little they know about them. So I'm, I'm kind of playing with um, juxtaposing a little bit um, these different kinds of approaches. And this is someone that Sheila pointed me towards an article um, by Nuri and the distinction between two types of social enterprise. So I guess we're playing with some of these frameworks and this is just a model, a different vision of how things might be organized. So one is the compensatory social enterprise that is addressing market failures, but still sitting within the global capitalist system. So it, they arise sometimes as third sector organizations. I think again, people might recognize this in Ireland since the publication of the social enterprise policy, social third sector organizations being pushed towards self-sustainability towards generating more traded income. 
um, but the social economic system itself is left intact. They're asked to address social problems, but without whole accompanying whole system change. And they do achieve system social change, and they do achieve impact within that system. The risk is that as um, they develop value, there's a potential for elites to capture the gains. Um, and I think there's some examples of that. It's a sort of social entrepreneurship um, gentrification effect of uh, where there was a deficient demand initially, but after 20 years of social enterprise work, there isn't deficient demand, but the value created is captured by the market um, because now there is a demand um, and that competitive model Sheila mentioned. So the transformative um, model is looking specifically to seek to transform the whole global capitalist system. Um, it's grounded in a belief that there are alternatives to capitalism and they need to be both, eth and they are both ethically and existentially, meaning our existence, um, required. Their social, ecological, cultural and economic systems in this model are not seen as separate. A they aim to discover and create the next alternative to the capitalist way of life. And the risk here, of course, is that financing has always been an issue for any movement that bases their ideology on a critique of capitalism. So I have um, just a, a couple of slides that help give a flavor of things that Nuri was talking about in her article. They're not from her figures, there's, but they resonated for me um, about the Nuri article. And this one is just looking at what other ways that organizing principles might be, what sorts of frameworks that would use and value diversity or produce no waste or how they would create spirals of abundant, abundance, um, not erosion and not extraction. So this one is from um, triopermaculture.com and they're looking at a different framing of, of society and having a complete making maybe use of the global capitalist idea that we are now globally connected through that globalization. But what uh, they're using is the global movement as a network of interconnection beyond political boundaries and beyond economic boundaries to create and foster a different sense of society and a different sense of um, stable and resilient investment and regenerative investment, I guess, um, that can work at all these levels in finding their ways to um, repair and develop biodiversity, to look at mitigating climate change and producing um, real sustainability. Another um, from the Just Par um, campaign, another uh, image that again is kind of talking in a visual way about some of the concepts that Muri is looking at. Um, and this one's from the Our Power campaign um, communities united for a just transition and it's kind of looking at this worldview the extractive community or economy worldview and the places where governments try to stop the bad and regulate um, and the kind of divestment um, uh, movements to try to stop and starve and stop the power of that and then what would that look like then in what what is going to build the new the regenerative economy having a, a, a cooperative um, model, which is touched on by Sheila as well, and the collaborative idea of working together in community in a, in a deep democracy and deeply participatory way, uh, looking at having the purpose of creating ecological and social well-being and regenerative resources um, and treating what we hold in common as sacred. Um, so I'm going to just, uh, I'm just watching my time now as well, just want to go through how that might play out in teaching and learning environments that could take account of messy reality, um, how a more inclusive system could enable those coming from the populations affected by the pressing, pressing issues and empowering learners from marginal communities. Um, and so one of the things that I came across in, in one of the pieces, there's a, a big book I came across by Oxford University Press, Press published in 2006 called Social Entrepreneurship, New Models of Sustainable Social Change. And there's a lot of different chapters in it. So a couple of this kind of pulls out from there that when it comes to the community level of development, the process of empowerment is the only recognized long-term solution to poverty. 
and that the focus then in um and it's interesting that Sheila also talked about focusing on process so the focus then on the quality of the process rather than its results and I think that's useful when both thinking about the developing the social enterprises so as a model for how to develop a social enterprise is focusing on the quality of the process which I could hear in lots of Rosie's examples of being responsive to the needs of the people that she's trying to work with um, and saying well maybe a workshop's not going to be enough I'm going to need to make a different interaction through phone calls so that is useful for developing social enterprises but I think it's also useful when designing um, learning experiences that reflect and parallel in some way the lived experiences both within the institution mm -hmm. and external to it. Um, so um, I'm going to just reference as well another person who you can go and find her on YouTube and again I think Sheila you pointed me to Daniela Pappy Thornton too because she talks about that heropreneurship and that kind of particularly in, uh, in the business um, world of pursuing a career path that's now going to promise opportunities not only to gain social status and earn money but an opportunity to save the world and that she references that being common in business schools in North and America and Europe um, with long late waiting lists now for not just investment banking interviews but shared by entrepreneurship training courses with social impact events um so she suggests that instead of heropreneurs that if she, and she's done this in oxford and in stanford can shift to, in the creation of a social enterprise um to being social change agents first and to apprentice themselves to social issues and find out later whether social enterprise is or isn't the right tool in service of communities um and this one is from Alex Jacob, also from the same book, who has written about helping people is difficult growth and performance in social entrepreneurs um, in development agencies. And he says, respectful dialogue, humility, sensitivity to other people's ways of seeing the world, genuine transparency about decision making and self-critical reflection and a sense of solidarity with the poor and marginalized is what he would probably put in as what, what I was asking for quality um, focus on the process. So I'm just, I think I'm nearly out of time there to want to go. We've got a good half an hour for talking. So I'm just going to finish up here that some of that might look like um, thinking of the community as the unit rather than the project or the social enterprise and thinking that would help then with, you know, all this effort that's being put in at the moment to new impact measurement mechanisms often have these approaches that set up for social investment targets almost in advance of implementation and then they have to be compared and monitored in you know these targets but social impact is you know always been known to be extremely um, difficult to pin down and especially to attribute to specific causal factors so because it's contingent on all the circumstances of each particular intervention so claiming this social enterprise has had this impact difficult but working with less short-term outcomes supporting participatory approaches including cycles of action and reflection and supporting communities development its own community-led development and again i think that can parallel um, what can happen in a learning and teaching environment that same participatory approach giving cycles so like daniel uh, thornton students in some cases go and apprentice themselves to a social issue for a couple of years and then come back and see if they're still going to see social enterprise as um, the tool and so alex jacobs again um, looking at performance in enterprise and relief and development he says community good community level development practice it requires those with power to give it up and be led with those without it so that's genuine participation um, and that pressure that that NGOs find difficult apparently to learn from past mistakes and I think just touching on what um, Sheila said the higher education faculty members in Ireland there's uh, you know a lot of innovation and attempt to bring social enterprise and social integration across lots of um, different new programs emerging in Ireland at present there is that difficulty that Sheila mentioned of 
um, having the departmental kind of sciences worry that social enterprise is a co-option of social justice work and it's just a wolf in, in sheep's clothing on the other side many business faculties aren't quite sure you know about social enterprise they see it sometimes as imprecise um, and compromised semblance of business practice because that's they they're they weaken the business practice because of their mission um, so it's not easy for to, to create them to thrive so there is um Gordon Bloom wrote about the SE laboratory, which is an incubator laboratory in Stanford, and I think also works with Harvard. And it was just a couple of things that I thought I'd finish up with tailoring to students um, how we might be co-designing. And one of the things is really about the permeable boundaries of the departments and silos and the institutions itself, so that co-production can happen in an interactive learning environment inside and outside of the program. Students can be going and apprenticing to the issue if they know nothing about it. Um, people can understand then from other departments those wider social issues and structural and systemic reasons that social change is important um, and broad participation, not only students, but the cross disciplinary factory, but even you know practitioners and non enrolled staff community development workers social enterprise representatives so that there's many role models and many examples both in person and through um, readings and then working in teams and partnerships and that peer support that Rosie mentioned is ever important. So it, social entrepreneurship also needs to include how to build human well-being with minimal ecological costs and so that not band-aid solutions um, and that we could take learnings from capitalism that can be retained within a system driven by a different logic, one which has more sustainable um, ecological and social and uh, objectives. So that's just going back to Nuri talking about the fact that the dominant strategies for social change in the past were shaped by a particular ideology, whether communist, socialist theory, that would posit a kind of linear march in the past to a moment in the future. But I think one of the things that Nuri talks, um, touches on is about the these counter hegemonic globalization as defining a, a globally organized project of transformation that will replace the dominant regime with one that makes equitable development of human capabilities and environmental stewardship priorities. And these do exist, like, like Sheila was talking about, they exist as social movements in the world today, making change in, in the now rather than in, in a kind of undefined future, like the Zapatistas in Mexico, Via Campanista, the international peasants movements, and so on. So I think that's kind of my framing of how we conquer these spaces of framing and enable uh, freedom and enable communities to influence the course of issues relevant to their own well-being. And I think that's probably where I'm going to finish up, that we're about to have in my new bridging moment between Ankasan and um, my new role in the Climate Justice Centre. Ireland's on the brink of some of the biggest investment this state has ever had in change with the climate action funds um, coming through from Ireland and the EU. And whether that's going to be captured, you know, by the hegemony or whether it's going to help with community wealth building, co-production, cooperative own ownership, and where social enterprise really has a place to play in that. Mm -hmm.